Hey everybody, this, this is Daniel Garza. Welcome to another episode of Put It Together. I'd like to start by thanking my producer, Mr. Kevin Moyers, for all his help and support. Thank you, sir. I want to invite everybody to come and join us at abnormalentertainment.com where you can find all the shows on the network. I'm sure there's something there for you. Go check them out. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. My handle is at Little Mexican, L-I-L-M-E-S-I-C-A-N. Or you can find me on Facebook at Little, uh, Little Mexican Productions, our new page. We can find all the shows, things that I'm doing, things that I'm working on, things that I like, and some things that I don't like are even on there. So go check it out. And coming soon, it's under construction. I know I keep saying that, but it finally will get done eventually. LittleMexicanProductions.com, where you can find everything that I'm involved in, everything that we're doing. Uh, if you want to be part of the show, you can find it there. If you want to send hate mail, send it to my producer. Uh, this week, I'm pretty excited. I'm starting a, uh, Kim is the first one of a series of nine authors that I'll be talking to. Kim O'Neill, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Daniel. How are you doing, ma'am? Oh, you know, I, I'm doing great, but to be completely honest, I'm a little hot. It's warm here in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell the audience, we, we chatted about this before we started. She turned off the air so it wouldn't sound in the background, which I, I appreciate because uh, I have my air conditioner on. I don't know what she's thinking, but San Pedro is hot and she's got no air on and uh, we, I won't just because that she looks a little sweaty, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I'm start fanning myself right now. <laughs> so if you, if you guys, when you guys meet her in person and you and you stare at her, Kim, Kim, Kim will know that you're staring because you're like, she does look a little sweaty all the time. What's going on here? It's because she's from San Pedro. It's okay. Don't worry. They're all like that. <laughs> I, I glisten. Listen, there you go. That sounds so, so much more romantic. So it much does. More, it sounds like you're an author. And that's how it sounds. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. I'm so excited that um, I have uh, all the authors of the book coming on my show, one after the other. And it's funny that everybody wanted an hour. I was going to give everybody like a segment and like, can everybody get a little spot? But no, it seems like everybody wanted an hour with me. I I'm going to say you want an hour with me so that you can promote, promote your book. That's, how I'm at. that's the way to do it. That's, that's the truth. And thank you so much for being able to offer us each an hour because this is, um, we're all so excited. This is a, a pivotal moment for, um, you know, maybe I should just speak for myself. This is a very pivotal moment for myself. And um, so anyway, so thank you for having us. I'm very excited to be here. My pleasure. And um, it, it's, it's an honor when, when people find, uh, I'll say in my case, when fi they find my show like the right venue to promote what they're doing. It's, it's really, it's, it's cool. It's, it's an honor. After five years of working hard, you kind of put out there. But let's, this show's about you, not about me, because I, I could talk about me. I can have, it's my show. I can pick a whole hour for myself later. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's totally your show. But uh, so Kim, tell us how you put it together. Wow. How do I put it together? So <clears throat> to, bo to just really hone down on how I put it together, it's from the inside out. From the inside out is, is, has really been a journey for me of learning that my inner world is what creates my outer world. And that's, I mean, that's, the true essence of, of the story that I wrote in mm -hmm. the Positive Minded People book. Um, there are many things in my story, but the one that really stood out in terms of where the turning point was, is my story has a lot to do with intuition okay. and what was going on internally with me. So how I put it together, uh, you know, I've learned and I'm still practicing. I don't know that it's ever anything you fully master, but I've learned that I need to check in with me first. I need to take care of myself first and then I can create things, you know, outside of me and, and attract the things that I want into my life that way. And that's, that in itself is such a journey to get to that point. Um, you're a young female. Um, Thank you. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> uh, and I'll say, now, even in, in, in this in this day and time with, with, with the millennials, I hate that word, but in, in order to just box the conversation, it's so hard to get to the point where 
you've got to invest in you first. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, that unless you've invested in you and you have that good foundation, anything you build over that is going to crumble. Yes. How, how old were you and how did that come about? Because it seems like you have a really good foundation. Oh, thank you. But nobody starts with a good foundation. We, we crumble a couple. It's like playing Jenga. We mess up a couple of games before we, we actually know how to play the game. Absolutely. Yes. So the foundation is, is absolutely the core of it. I think a lot of us, we, um, we're influenced and impacted by the people around us, who we, you know, the environment we grow up in, the people in our lives. And over time, there may be a turning point, a, a situation that becomes a catalyst for us to finally break all that down and start fresh. And that's an easy way of putting it, but that's, you know, that's what happened in my story. And there have been many times in, in my life where I've experienced something that was really challenging, heartbreaking, uh, something really hard to go through. But the story that I write about in the book was, was I think the biggest catalytic moment in my life. And I was around the age of 24, 25 when the story begins. And it started with, you know, at the beginning of, of that year, I, like most years, created my list of what do I want to attract into my life that year? What, what do I want to accomplish by the end of the year? And one of the things I put on that list was, I want to, I want to have a best friend who's a guy. We are, you know, we have this really close bond, this really solid friendship with the potential for something more. Hmm. And I didn't know how I was setting myself up for everything that came later, but that potential for something more uh, played a much bigger role later down the line when I met this person. We did develop a really strong, solid friendship, and he always wanted something more, and I didn't, but I kept thinking I needed to make it be something more. And so that is where things started to uh, break down and later I ended up, you know, feeling the effects of. Right. So, and it's really, I'm so glad that you were, you're so open right in the beginning of the conversation because people want to romanticize it. People want to make it sound like, oh, I had this come to Jesus moment and hallelujah. And not every aha moment comes after a great adventure or a great moment in our lives. Sometimes we have to fall hard. Yeah. And and I guess the term rock bottom, uh, we have to hit rock bottom either physically, mentally, spiritually, to realize that you need to change your life around. Is that the situation? It is. And it's interesting that you touch on, um, you know, this come to Jesus moment. Uh, I think when you're in the thick of it, at least when I was in the thick of it, it was literally uh, moment to moment, just trying to hang on. So let me let me share just a little bit more about my story. Basically, okay. we you know we were these friends who became so attached to each other, um, absolutely a deep affection and love for this other person. And about three years into the relationship, because we kept trying the off and on dating thing and it wasn't working. But about three years into it, I realized, oh my goodness, we are so attached that we are somewhat codependent on each other. And if either of us are ever going to actually develop, you know, a, a solid romantic relationship with someone else, that something's going to have to happen to tear us apart from each other. And when I had that realization, I, f I had a freak out moment. I thought, oh, no, 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 that, oh, What's, you know, what's, right. I don't know. I don't know if I can deal with that. And um, about a year later, you know, it, it came out of the blue. And uh, basically, he met someone else. And that was the pathway he went on. And I, that's where my world crumbled. Um, because I was very 
like I said, I was very attached to him. He right. was he was a safety blanket for me. And and when you know over time, as you know, I was reflecting back on this story over the years and trying to figure out how to even tell the story. Because I knew at the time when this happened, there was going to come a time where I was going to need to tell the story. And I didn't know how I was going to do that because there's so much wrapped up in this that I didn't know if it was going to ever make sense to anyone else. Right. So it really took me about nine years to even tell the story. And what I realized is I continued to dig deeper and deeper and do my own work because that's the place that it brought me to within myself. I realized that, okay, the, the, the true story didn't start with him and that relationship. It really started with going back to what you mentioned, my foundation. And my foundation was rocky from the get-go because I never really had a solid relationship with my dad. And, and uh, you know, I had been married years ago and I got married young and divorced young. So I had that also in my back pocket. Right. So by the time I met this friend, I was looking for something that, you know, whether it was going to be romantic or not, I wanted it to stick. And, uh, you know, ultimately wasn't something I could control. And yeah. it's not, never anything any of us can control, right? So. And you read my mind. That was the question I was asking. Like, it doesn't start there. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people just go back that far in the layers and go, oh, okay, it, it's that guy. And I was just hung up on him or the girl or whatever. But there's always a back, I always tell people, there's always a backstory. And unless you read that backstory for yourself, because we forget, I think. Yes. We, we want to forget that it was somebody else that influenced us. Not somebody else's fault. It was somebody else that influenced the way we act now. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, and it's so, it's hindsight is twenty twenty. Oh, Oh, course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if it were that easy. Of course. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I didn't know, you know, until I went through this this really breakdown of who I was. I didn't know that I had all this unresolved hurt and anger within me. I thought that I had dealt with things to whatever degree that I needed to deal with them. I thought that I was strong enough that certain things didn't affect me to the level that they clearly did affect me. And, you know, so I didn't know I had all that under the surface until everything was stripped away and I just had to focus on me and get me back and, and make sure that I was well, that's, yeah. you know, and, and that's where the inner journey really started. And I, I was, you know, continued to build from there. Well, as I was reading over your chapter, um, all I had to do was change the names <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, she's, how did she get into my diary? Girl, like, uh -uh, <laughs> oh, no. wow. Because um, I almost started to cry as I was reading. I'm like, I oh. know her. I mean, you make, you, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you about the book because I want them to read the book, but um, you and I will know the secret, what I'm talking about. <laughs> the rest of the people listening, you have to get the book to read it. But if, if you just change names and change situations, that was me. My first relationship was at 20 years old and um, it was my first adult relationship and we moved in together and then he cheated on me and I went berserk. Um, to this day, I remember a friend of mine had a key to my apartment. Uh, this is in Dallas and he lived in Fort Worth and we'd broken up. I won't say names, but we broke up and uh, I was miserable. I was in, and this is going to date me, but I was in my closet in the closet with my boom box listening to George Michael stay and man oh you could, you could the neighbors downstairs would knock on the ceiling like shut the hell up because oh. I would I would rewind and play and George, only George Michael could understand me <laughs> so oh. and my friend showed up and he could hear the music and I hear him yelling for me like Daniel Daniel and I didn't answer he opens the car he goes you're kidding me like you, like you're kidding. He threw away my cassette. He took my room box, took me out, got me all like sh uh, showered because <laughs> I've been in the closet the whole weekend. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. So um, I'm like, wow. How many of us go through that? Not as I that, but um, and we blame it on the other person. 
We want to yeah, find the yes, way. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, you, think, well, you know what? Thank you for sharing that and, and for, you know, for sharing that you can relate to the story um, and you can identify with it w within your own experiences. Something that really came out of me telling this story <laughs> is, you know, I started to have judgment about it, thinking that, um, that maybe it wasn't going to sound uh, either relatable or important enough. And um, I don't know, maybe this is a side point, but I'm just going to insert this here because it's coming up. So, you know, I really had to learn I, that we and I need to stop judging our stories, you know, against someone else's story. Right. And whatever your story is, that's, you know, it's your story for a reason. And that's where, you know, you, you have your breakthrough moment. And um, oh, I'm starting to lose track of my thought a little bit, but it's just, <laughs> I it just, you know, everyone's story is important and it doesn't matter how the breakthrough comes through. It's that it does come through. And what did you learn from your story? And so anyway, I just, yeah, no, no. To it, 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 if I can wrap up what you just said, because um, I was just, I do horoscopes for a radio show and I was just doing the horoscopes this morning and I forget what sign it was because I've not forgotten, but I, one of the signs I was telling them is if you don't make peace with your, with your memories, if you don't make peace with your, with your history, you can't move forward in the right direction because you keep, you keep detouring around the facts. You've got to make peace with it. And I'm 46 now. This happened when I was 20, and I was looking to be saved for a long time. I yes. was. Uh, I went through most of my 20s. I went into rehab when I was 36. Okay. So I spent 16 years in drugs and alcohol, and kept looking for somebody. After that breakup, because we eventually we got back together and we broke up again because he cheated with the same person. Wow. Um, when we finally broke up and I moved away from, from Dallas, every relationship for the next like 10 years, 12 years, I was looking for them to save me, to pull me out of drugs, to pull me out of alcohol, to pull me out of the financial situation that I was. I kept looking for somebody to save me. And, and, and reading last night, I was like, yeah, somebody else, somebody else. And, but it wasn't oh. until I sobered up that I, I made peace with that part of my story. It's like, I was an alcoholic. I was, a, I was an alcoholic, I was a, a drug addict. Had nothing to do with him, nothing. It was just yeah. me holding on to this memory and the only way I could put a lock on that memory was with drugs and alcohol. And the moment I took the lock off, the story came out and I was freed from it. I didn't have to hold it. So much energy. What do you think about that? We, we, hold, we use so much energy holding our secrets in. Yes. Oh, goodness. Daniel, how much time do we have? Because I want to say so much. <laughs> we still have about 40 minutes to go. Oh, goodness. So, yes. It's so easy to, to look at the other person in our story or whatever the other thing that's you know, opposing us as the villain and think that uh, that's the person to blame and I am the victim and someone needs to save me, someone needs to rescue me. That's certainly what I did for a while. I did certainly blame him and um, you know, he wasn't very responsive. When I was having my just total breakdown, which um, even surprised myself because I'd always seen myself as a very strong, independent person and then here I was like completely freaking out and just a total wreck. And he wasn't very responsive. And I thought, what? He's going to abandon me now? Like, we were so close for, for so long. And, and, you know, and I had reached out to friends and, um, you know, only a small handful of friends. And they would be there for me to the extent that they could. But ultimately, no one really was able to grasp what I was going through. And so it was a very personal, internal journey that I went through. And here's what I can look back and say now is really good. It's actually a good thing that he didn't, um, I maybe I shouldn't say it's a good thing, but I can see how it served me that he wasn't there for me more than he was. It's, I can see how it's a good thing that my friends couldn't quite identify with 
what I was going, you know, what I was experiencing. On the outside, it just looked like, wow, Kim's really sad. On the inside, it was like, uh, no, dude, my world is crumbling and I'm hanging on by a thread here. And um, the reason why that serves me is because it, you know, I, I didn't want thing, you know, I didn't, I didn't want my, my life to end. That's, that's the extent that it brought me to. Um, and it took me a long time to even really say that. So I'm just going to go ahead and say the word suicide, uh, cause I don't want to contribute to a stigma of not being able to talk about it at the time though. It was, it was very, um, I, you know, I was, I was very scared to, to say that word, but you know, that's, that's the depths of what it took me to, but that's not ultimately what I wanted. And so I was, I was reaching, searching for, you know, what can help me. And it brought me to all these personal development tools and um, got me to understand and connect with my own spirituality on a deeper level, ultimately to the point where I could be my own rescue, save myself. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm throwing my hands in the air, people. Yes, that's exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, and and even that, I think, you know, might take a few tries to, or, you know, moments to really start to embrace that and embody that and, and get to that space where you can at any time connect with your own inner peace and <clears throat> so that you're not as impacted or taken down by whatever chaos is going on around you in the world. So... I, that's one of the biggest things I wanted to say based off what you just said. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, I think it's really important that you mention the fact that it, you don't get it right the first time. Yeah. You, you don't. You, you come out of a relationship or you come out of a situation like that and it's new. It, you, you have, because you go through a grieving process because you're losing a part of you that you were so used to. You held on to that the victim you is become yeah. such a part of your life that the, it's like getting a divorce or losing a best friend that a best friend that's bad for you it's the bad friend that keeps gets you in trouble and when it's gone you're like what am i going to do now life is going to be boring but you make a new friend with the yes. new version of you and it takes a little while cuz you don't know what they like what they don't like uh, yeah. I think when you're not a solid person to begin with, and so often we may not even be aware of that, but when you aren't solid enough with yourself, then you think that someone else is, you know, just like that, you know, people say, you know, oh, my other half, my better half. Well, how about two holes making awesomeness? And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what it taught me to learn is, is, you know, I need to be good with me first. Yeah. And, that will always be important that your relationship with yourself is always going to be the foundation of every other relationship that comes after it. So if you don't have that first, everything else is going to be rocky and susceptible to, you know, any, any chaos that comes its way. Yeah. I, when I was about five years clean and sober, when I met my now boyfriend and it took about that long for me to, to have a couple of little relationships and uh, I had a, a pretty long one, but I was still trying to find out what I wanted to do with my life, who I wanted to be, because the things that I was before drugs and alcohol, I mean, during drugs and alcohol, was not who I wanted to be now. Uh, I moved to California and people in California didn't know me as an alcoholic or a drug addict. They had no perception. So sometimes it takes a big move for you. I mean, that's the reason in AA we talk about people, places, and things because you have to move. I know now everybody is like, well, I just can't get up and move. No, maybe you can't physically get up and move, but you can, you can start readjusting your life. If, yeah. if you kept going, and I know people are like, it's dumb, but if you just stop hanging out with the same people that keeping you down and you know this, that might change. If you stop hanging out, um, I don't know, at the same bar, at the same restaurant, that might change. If you, if, if you tell me, because I, you know, I do readings for people and I have clients like, they're like, oh, I, I come home and I have a glass of wine and then I start missing him. Well, then stop having a glass of wine when you get home. Like, obviously that's your doorway to it and now you're like crying. Anyway, I got myself out to fight. But, uh, 
<laughs> oh, you know, awareness is so key. I mean, to me, that's, that's the very first step in being able to shift anything is even just being aware of where things are getting off track and what is that, um, what is that trigger that really yeah. takes us down one path versus another. So, um, talk about uh, transitioning. Um, I know I'm going to probably get like nine different versions of the same story, which I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And I, I, <laughs> this being the first of the series, um, you're the first one of the series. Yay! Yay! Thank um, you! <laughs> I, I'm really excited because I'm going to get nine different versions of nine people's lives, and it's all going to end in, in this book. Yeah. I've never had that on my show. It's really exciting. I don't think even Oprah did this. In your face, Oprah. Um, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I always wanted to be the Mexican gay male version of Oprah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I just did my happy dance for all of you watching. I mean, for listening. Um, how? Because I'm, sh oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I have an imagination that somebody took the initiative of contacting people or getting people together and, and this comes together. How was your part into this whole thing? Yeah. So, well, so the book, so the book is called positive minded people, inspiring stories of overcoming adversity for living a more positive life. So you're right. There are nine of us who have our own stories of transformation and stories of adversity and then the transformation uh, and everything that came out of it. And for me in particular, this, you know, Benny Mayberry and Calvin Witcher, they're the, they're the two people at the helm of all this. And Benny Mayberry has a meetup group called Positive Minded People. And I joined the meetup group, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago. And I was like, oh, wow, they do a lot of things. They are really positive. They sound awesome. And I never did anything with the group. <laughs> but they started to put together this book and I, I had already decided I'm ready to be an author. I want to, I want to contribute to a book. And I saw the announcement come through that they were doing this. And I said, Oh my goodness, I think this is the one. And it turned out it, it was, I'm so glad I said yes to this. Can you give us an idea where you were spiritually, mentally when, when that happened? When I, I, when you decided that you were going to do it, you know what? I don't know that it was necessarily, Oh, to do the book. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you, you read the announcement that there's going to be this book ah. and then you're like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I, and I, where were you mentally? Because obviously you've been through a journey. Um, there's uh, stop me if I'm wrong, but there's self doubt. Yes. There's moments of encouragement. There's this bolt of energy that comes through and, and you want to do everything. Then there's a little bit of self-doubt again. Um, and, and I've seen it through a lot of clients. Like there's this, it, it varies, but the, the emotions are all, we all have the same thing. Yeah. So when you read that announcement and you're like, screw it, I'm going to do that now. Where were you mentally and spiritually? So as I mentioned, I was already in, you know, looking for an opportunity to contribute to a book. So I had seen a few others and they weren't quite right. And so I let those ones pass. And this one at first came through as an email and I was like, Oh, let me, let me, you know, look, look into this one. And it started off with a phone call, just schedule a free phone call and let's talk about it. And so Calvin and I, we did that. We spoke about it. And I think it was before he was even done you know, giving me his full spiel about, how, you know, everything about the book and how we were going to do it. I knew instinctively it was a yes for me. This particular opportunity was just, a, it was a hell yes. <laughs> and so I, I told him, and I remember he kind of had this moment where he was like, uh, uh, oh, uh, okay. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sold. Like, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> you don't need to explain it anymore. So it was really something that I just, uh, I, I just, I felt and I just knew. And so that's, that, that was my moment. That was your moment? Yeah. Um, how do you begin the process of that first word on your computer? Oh my gosh, I love that you asked this. So what I have to say on this is the journey of writing a story is a whole journey in itself. <laughs> so, or I should say the act of writing a story is a whole journey in itself. So 
again, like, you know, this story that really happened nine years ago. And I knew back then there's going to come a time I'm going to need to write about this and share it with others. And when I said yes to this book opportunity, I honestly didn't really know what I was going to write about. I didn't, you know, I wasn't recalling immediately, oh, I'm going to write about that story from nine years ago. I just knew that, yes, this is my opportunity. I have plenty of things I could write about. And after I, you know, we locked it in and I was in, it was a few weeks that passed that I even forgot that I said yes to this. <laughs> and I remembered, I was like, oh, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be writing something. <laughs> because we had a little bit of time there to you know, put it all together. And so I thought, okay, no, I need to, I need to really sit down with this. And um, I, I honestly, I don't even remember the moment, but I just know that all of a sudden it came to me and I knew that this was the story. I, I did start jotting down some notes to try and just, okay, you know, let's get the, get the ideas flowing and what stories could I write about? And when I realized this was the story, it pretty much flowed instantly when I started to write it. Now, with that said, of course, there have been many revisions <laughs> and right. many, many drafts since then. But um, I knew that this was the one because it flowed from start to finish. And, you know, again, my, so my chapter is about intuition. It's titled Intuition, Can You Hear Me Now? Yeah. And the reason for that, I mean, going into the story is I knew from day one Day one, when I met um, in the in the book, I named him Sam. So, you know, I knew from day one when Sam and I met that we were not meant to even be romantic. I knew that from day one. And yet I continued to allow myself to think, well, you know, but maybe I should be more open. You know, I mean, we have so many other things about our relationship that are um, just amazing qualities, rare to find in any relationship. And I think there are a lot of messages out there in society that tell us that if you have a strong connection with someone, then, you know, what's stopping you? What, you know, why, you know, what more do you need in a relationship? So I really thought that I needed to try harder. I thought I needed to make this relationship be something that did not feel natural for me. So that's why I call it intuition because my intuition told me on day one that Kim, no, this is not right for you. But what was interesting is as I was writing this story, you know, I wrote it from start to finish the first time around. And I was like, oh, this feels really good. And then you start to go deeper and revise things. And as I was in that process of writing, that's when I started to second guess everything. And so I, I started thinking, oh my goodness, okay, no, maybe this isn't the right story. And I was finding all the little flaws with it. And so I started writing about four to five different other stories that I would start and, start and then stop, start and stop. And none of those really, you know, got beyond one page. And finally, I just had to stop writing altogether and again, go within and go, Kim, stop it. You know how to do this. And so I went inside and I I just had to ask myself, look, what's, what's going on here? And what is the story that needs to be written now, that needs to be told now? And I came right back to, it's the story that I write about in this chapter. So that's what I found so interesting, is the journey, just writing the story itself, was exactly about what I even titled it. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So um, I have several questions, because I, I find it really cool. Uh, First, what were the voices in your head telling you Ooh. as you were writing this uh, your chapter? That's a great question. To some degree, I believe that when things are really, let me rephrase that. When things are really flowing, I think it's easy to not quite know what the voices in your head are telling you because the information is being channeled. And we may not really even realize that. So, you know, if you're ever having a conversation with some with someone and you say something and it sounds amazing and they're like, oh my gosh, I love that. Wait, say that again. And you're like, wait, what did I just say? I don't, <laughs> I, I don't even know what I just said. You know, <laughs> so it's, I, I think there was a degree of that where it just, once it came, it flowed through. Um, and so in terms of what the, what the voices or the thoughts were, I don't know that I can really even pinpoint those, but I can say that it was a feeling of ease and being in the flow. That's what really stood out for me. 
as you're writing and rewriting and editing, was there something you were afraid of to find that stopped you from, or that pushed you to want to write about something else? Judgment. Judgment from readers, from audiences. You know, judgment that my story is not good enough, that it's not worthy of being in the mix with all these other amazing authors' stories. Judgment that it you know, may not make sense to other people why this situation was so devastating for me. Um, this is, you know, yeah, uh, something you said earlier, I, I, it's come back around, I wanna, I wanna touch on this. I think for a lot of stories, the, the supposed villain is very obvious. We can say, oh, that person attacked me, or that person was mean to me, or, you know, this, this uh, you know, natural disaster happened, right? And these were the things that are, you know, that happened on the outside. And now we can understand when we look at someone else's story, why they are so distraught and why they're having to, you know, rebuild their life, you know, from the ground up. And in my story, um, although, sure, there's another person in the story, um, he had every right to move on. He had every right to meet someone else. And you know, take his life in a different direction. So the real villain in my story was really myself. And it was the negative self-talk that I had going on within me. Because as I was dealing with just how heavy this was for me, I had so many, uh, just so many, you know, negative thoughts and beating myself up, thinking, you know, how come I couldn't do better? Like, why wasn't I able to make this relationship work? Somehow thinking that I was a bad person and that this was my, mm. that this was my karma because I wasn't able to, to really get there. I wasn't able to just say, yes, you know what, Sam, you are my person too for life. And you know, that's it. Um, that didn't feel true for me and I wasn't able to, and that's why I wasn't able to ever get there, but I, I wasn't able to accept that. Uh, until after going through that whole breakdown and, you know, deepening my connection to myself. I mean, and it, and it started with a whole myriad of things. I mean, it started with, um, gosh, it, there's so much. I mean, it, <laughs> there were a lot of tears. There was yeah. a lot of insomnia. And it's, it, you know, I started with just going to bookstores and looking for what, what can help me and finding, um, you know, books on tape and affirmation CDs and learning about meditation and just trying so many different things to find something that would give me relief. Right. And yeah. Um, where is that Kim now? The Kim that was broken down yeah. and ah, uh, she, <laughs> that's a good question. Where is that Kim now? She is, she has an awareness that, that, gosh, the way you phrase that, the, the, she, that Kim is stronger on a deeper level, stronger in a new way. I was stronger before that, but I'm even stronger now. So I now know how to, how to find the stillness within me and know that it's okay if someone I love makes a decision that doesn't include me. Uh, that if, you know, if there's negativity going on around me, not that you necessarily want to stay in a space like that, but if there is, I now know how to go within myself, ground myself, and be solid and not right. be as affected by what someone else is doing. Or what else is going on in the world? Yeah, I think that's uh, from my personal experience and from people that I've, I've worked with. One of the hardest things to do at any point in our lives is to go in, in ourselves because we know what's in there. We might hide it. We might put a blanket over it and like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. And we forget it. But it's all in there. All the memories, all, all the bruises, all the bumps, all the awards, everything's in there. And it, you have to sort through boxes sometimes to find what you need to survive. But in the, in, in finding that you see things that hurt you and you're, you're always so scared. So it, it takes, 
it takes a lot of courage to go inside yourself and and find the good stuff. Something I didn't realize, yes, I completely agree, it takes a lot of courage. And something I didn't realize for a really long time is that I wasn't really feeling my feelings. Hmm. I thought that I was. I mean, we, it, it sounds so simple. It sounds like, well, yeah, you know, we know how to feel our feelings. Something happens that doesn't feel good, and I feel it instantly. And I know for myself, and I've seen in a lot of other people, that there's that natural instinct to want to block it off, to stop it, to close it off. Um, and maybe that's because we're afraid of what might happen if we actually do feel those feelings, go to that place. I know that I was for a very long time. So a big part of this journey that didn't even come until years later was knowing that it's okay. First off, even knowing that, huh, yeah, I think I do need to revisit some of those feelings. And then taking the time to do that. And the first time I really did it, I did it with another, uh, with a another coach, which is something that I do now as well. And I love that I'm able to support people um, through their own journeys. But, but, you know, be in a safe space and know that it's okay. You're, you know, it's okay. We're just going, we are safe where we are in this moment. And I'm going to just take a moment to feel that feeling and let it pass through. And what I learned is that it's not going to take weeks and months and years. It's not going to be a huge setback like I feared that it would be. It literally can take seconds or you know a minute or two to just feel it and allow it to pass. And then I can move on, not having that energy within me anymore. Hell yeah. If more <laughs> people realize that. I get so many people that sit across me, they're like, oh, I've been feeling this for the last 20 years. I'm like, why? Like, why have you been carrying out? Like, and like my, like Christian, my friends are like, how much money did that make you? He's all about the, how much, how much did you get out of that? Like, how much is it worth now? What is it like bonds? Like, I, are you collect? I'm like, no, then let yeah. it go. Like, tell me what it is and let it go. Cause I, he was in a better position in a lot of things than I was when we met. And I was always afraid about like, if I tell him this, he's going to run away. Or if I, he's like, I can see something's troubling you and you being so insecure is what actually pushes me away just be more secure by yourself like hey i was a drug guy I, I was i did this i did that and just you know let it go and, and move on now we can have a conversation instead of oh i don't want to talk about it oh i can't tell you because i'll feel it again or it just brings back bad memories and then like then i really will never know you so that's a great point I accepting our story it's it's interesting because choosing to accept your story is actually what can help you release the energy of the story. So, and no longer hold on to it. So I, I know a lot of times when I thought like accepting something, accepting something, that means I'm just going to hold on to it and it's going to be stuck with me forever. No, it's actually quite ironic. Once you accept it, you can actually get kind of, you know, get rid of it in a way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. yeah our, our memories are, are great. Um, Oh, I, I just lost the word. Um, I'll think about it in a minute. But uh, they'll sabotage you. They'll, um, yeah, oh, I forgot the other word. I'll remember in a minute. All right. But we are at the point in our show where traditionally my guests will send out some words of wisdom to our listeners. Um, Kim O'Neill, what words of wisdom do you have for my listeners? The, so many things, but ultimately before anyone else can be there for you, you have to make sure that you show up for yourself and that can come up in a myriad of ways. But if you're feeling lost and alone, um, <clears throat> you know, do your best to surround yourself with supportive people, loving people, but also make sure that you're taking time to, to go within and heal the parts of you that need to be healed. And, and, you know, be responsible for how you're showing up in the world and for the energy that you're taking on and the energy that you're putting out. And um, I really believe that the more a person knows who they are beyond their physical existence, the more inner peace that they'll have within themselves, regardless what chaos is going on around them. Wow. That was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> um, blackmail. That's the word I was thinking about. Your, your memories can blackmail you into thinking, into thinking that if you talk about them, 
that people will not love you anymore or not care for yeah. you or not. And it's, I mean, I'm here to tell you folks, no, <laughs> it's not true. You're sometimes sharing will set you free. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's from a 10 year recovering alcoholic and drug addict. I can tell you that for sure. The moment I let all my truths out, I was like, what can you hold over me? There's nothing you can say that I haven't said myself. Like, what can you hold over me? So it's, it's when you when you own your story, your story no longer owns you. Exactly. And we're all we're all cool people out there. If if you're listening, nobody has told you lately. You are cool. You're a great yes. person. You just need to let go of those stories that are holding you uh, hostage. And man, you you'll realize. Um, so tell us a little more about the book. Uh, when it comes out, what's the story? Where, when can we read it? Where can we get it? Absolutely. So the book, again, is called Positive Minded People, Inspiring Stories of Overcoming Adversity for Living a More Positive Life. And we anticipate it coming out in October 2017. Um, we have a website, positivemindedpeople.com. I believe we also have positivemindedpeoplebook.com. We've got Facebook and Instagram of the same name. And absolutely check it out. All of these stories are so powerful. And the book is even structured in a way so that the stories like flow into one another. So even though it's nine separate stories, it, right. to some degree, it's a cohesive, um, you know, it's a cohesive unit, all of us together. So that's how you can find out about it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, more, what else are you involved in? What else do you do? What else can we know about you? Oh yeah. So I am a personal empowerment coach and mentor, and I also have my own. Um, I also have my own radio show podcast called Every Day Is a New Day on BBS oh, okay. Radio. Yeah, on bbsradio.com, and I I help people rediscover and reclaim who they really are, so they can confidently move forward and achieve their dreams. And I'm also a youth mentor, so I work with youth. Um, I started off doing interview coaching, helping people prepare for employment interviews. So I work with job seekers. And that was one of the avenues that really led me to knowing that, you know, the, the real work of preparing for a job actually goes a lot deeper. It's not just about surface level job prep, answer this question, you know, that right. sort of thing. It's no, it's about who are you being? Who are you owning? Um, you know, do you own your greatness? Do you know how amazing and cool you are? Just like you said. And and so uh, helping people to be able to find that within themselves, um, that's, you know, I really believe that every single person on this earth is amazing. They, everyone has their own beautiful gifts to offer. And I love to be able to help people see that and really own it and embrace it. Well, we could do a whole other podcast on you. Oh. Uh, I mean, talk, talk about put it together. You are my show. You are what I, what I work with helping people put their lives back together. So um, thank thank you. Thank you. I saw that similarity too. And, um, and yeah, so thank you so much yeah. for having me, Daniel. Part of the, uh, we still have about 10 minutes to go. You're good. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, part of the original concept of this show was me dealing with my sexuality when I was younger, dealing with um, being diagnosed with AIDS when I was 30, drugs and alcohol and, finding myself and how to put all that together to make it work for me. Um, and that's where the podcast was born. And then um, after cancer, being a cancer survivor and having an ostomy and nearly dying a couple of times and relationships failed and moving from Texas, like everything just, and I'm like, people would have asked like, how do you make it? How are you always in a good mood or how are you, I'm like, I don't know. I must be stupid because other no. people would be, other people would be like, crap this, I'm out of here. Um, and you talked about suicide earlier. I mean, it definitely, I deal with depression too. And uh, after all the health issues I've had too, a little bit of PTSD on that aspect. So there's a lot there and, and trying to put it all together. It, it, like trying to make it look this easy. I tell people it's a lot of gum and duct tape putting all this together. And it's, Sometimes you have to just put it back in there somehow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things that I've had to learn, and I'm still learning, um, is that less control is more. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yep. So it's, I, I consider myself a recovering perfectionist and <laughs> have had to, con to continually learn to, okay, you can, you do as much as you can do. And then at some point it's about surrendering and allowing things to flow in. And that's what's, that's why it's so important to also be good with yourself, have that stability and inner peace within yourself, because then you can go, okay, you know what? I've done as much as I can. And I don't know why this crazy situation is still happening out, you know, outside of me happening in my world. That's not what I was going for. That, you know, I, I was doing all this other hard work and effort to create something else in my life. And why is this challenge, challenging situation showing up? It's about, just allowing things because there's so much more than what we can see on the surface. We don't always know how that challenging situation is actually going to help us. Right. And like, like we were talking about earlier, you know, um, it's not about someone else rescuing us. If someone had, let's say when I was in the thick of my situation, if someone had really been able to come in and rescue me, then you know what? knock on wood, God forbid, maybe I would have had to go through something like that again so that I could finally have the breakdown where I learn that I have to rescue myself. And, and I think that, you know, that's, that can be really hard to grasp. I know from, for me, some of the, the people that really trigger my desire to want to rescue someone else are the people I love the most, my closest friends, my closest family. Um, and I have to, at some times, go, okay, stop, you know, you know, to some degree, you have to let people go through their things. Right. And, you know, that's, you know, that, yeah, I think it, it is hard. It is hard. And I think every situation is unique and you have to, you have to let yourself off the hook too and go, no, this, you know, because I'm, because I'm stepping back a little bit, you know, and it, that doesn't mean I don't love them. That doesn't mean that I'm not here for them. Um, Anyway, that's a whole other avenue we yeah. go in, but but definitely, I, I I would love to have you back and talk more about what you do personally. I would uh, love but to. But now knowing that you're so close, we have to do the next one in person over a cup of coffee, so that we don't have to wear earbuds and, and we can actually talk. Um, and sweat in our apartment. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I, I, we uh, we were starting the show, and Kim was like, "I can't hear you. I can't hear you." I'm like. Maybe you put some earbuds on and be like, yeah, it was such, no, a, it was such no. a dumb moment. <laughs> and then I thought about it. I'm like, you pretty much just insulted her like in the first five minutes of the conversation. Like, uh, yeah, like if you wear some earbuds, if you pull her, maybe then you can hear me. And then I realized that it was because I, on my end, it wasn't completely plugged in. Uh, my earbuds were not completely plugged in. So I was like, oh, wait, let me do this. Click. Oh, yeah, ah! that's better. I'm like, should I tell her that it was my end or not? But uh, uh, since, since I talked about your uh, your sweating over there, I, I figured I could throw that story in there. Too. Oh, thank you for reminding everyone. Step, step, <laughs> I'll step up to my end and what I did. Um, I appreciate that. Well, tell everybody again before we go uh, where they can find you, uh, websites, information. Absolutely. So you can find me in numerous places. My website is KimO'NealCoaching.com and O'Neill is O-N-E-I-L-L, KimO'NealCoaching.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, also on BBS Radio as well. The book, again, is called Positive Minded People, Inspiring Stories of Overcoming Adversity for Living a More Positive Life, coming out really soon in October. And um, check it out. But the, you know, the website is the same name, positivemindedpeoplebook.com. And you know, we look forward to connecting with people. I look forward to connecting with people. Do you know if there'll be a, a launch party or will you be signing books somewhere or... I, we have, we have quite a few things in the work, uh, in the works. I do plan to do some book signings and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still connecting and reaching out and putting things together. So, you know, all will be revealed as time goes on, but, um, so yeah, I don't have any dates for anything, but absolutely. If you, you know, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, um, I'm, you will be notified of all those different events. Well, please give us here at Put Together a heads up so we can be there with microphones and cameras to uh, show this. I would love to follow this through and see where it goes. Um, it. Plus, if I meet you, I can get my book signed, so that would be pretty cool. Absolutely. Um, I would love to meet you in person. That would be awesome. All right. Um, hang on. Don't go anywhere. Let me just say goodbye to these folks. Everybody listening, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. It's the, uh, one of a nine. It's a series for all the authors. 
So if you're listening to this one and you get excited, there will be more. Um, oh, God, there we are. Uh, for now, I want to thank again my producer, Mr. Kevin Moyers. Thank you, sir. I invite y'all to listen to us at abnormalentertainment.com. We can find all the shows on the network. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Little Mexican, uh, L I L M E S I C A N. If you want to be on the show or have somebody you want to nominate for the show, you can uh, email message me in any of those sites or email me at Daniel G Garza, D A N I E L G G A R Z A, at hotmail.com. Put podcasts on the subject so I know and I won't delete it. Um, Kim, thank you again for being on the show. Thank Where you, Daniel. Good? Everybody listening, uh, make sure you follow us. All her information will be on my Facebook page. Check it out there. And for now, this is Daniel Garza saying, hey, put it together. And